I've been engaged with LARP theory for um, 20 years, I suppose. Um, and in sort of in the process, like in this Nordic conversation, being involved since, the, you know, like pre-internet fanzines, Nordic LARP fanzines, which some of you may be ancient enough to remember was a thing for a little while there, uh, that we made on paper and then mailed to each other in envelopes. Um, and that was sort of the, in some ways the beginning of the Nordic conversation. And, and we needed to name stuff and start to think about things. And I'm going to return to this a little bit uh, um, later, how it has affected this theory. But then it turns out if you know how to make design LARPs, you actually have a skill set that is applicable in a lot of other spaces. And this is just like out of curiosity. How many of you in any way feel that things you have learned from LARP are also useful for you in your professional lives? Yes. Um, so that's also happened here. And in very practical terms, we extracted a practice of experience design out of LARP and started using it um, in, in consulting basically for um, in the public sector and cultural institutions that my company PDA works with. Um, and, and also, of course, with commercial clients. And also teaching this a lot because it's not like we don't own this stuff. Like everybody here has developed this together. Um, and, and if we have made it a little bit more coherent, it's just to be able to use it ourselves. And it turned out that when you teach experience design, even if it grows out of the LARP design practice, actually that forces you to be very specific about some things that become visible. So you can then suddenly you get some new tools that you can apply to making our own LARPs better. And now this stuff that you kind of already know has gone full circle and now I'm coming here to, to talk about the things that I teach to other people normally. Um, so that's why this is a whole weird meandering journey and this whole talk is going to feel like this. Because we're going to be zooming in and out and in and out and in and out of like small social situations and also what is life. That's the like, range of the conversation today. And you should know that, if, that this is the sort of weird ass theory. And when it comes to like, also I want to make LARPs, like I want practical tools for making stuff that happens during my LARP more interesting, there is a, a, a sibling talk to this talk, which is tomorrow at the same time, where, which will go into that more deeper and that will be by my colleague, Bjarke Pedersen. So let's start here. What is life? A very um, famous definition of life is that life is one damn thing after another. Um, I guess like in our experience of living life as like beings uh, in the world is that we're bombarded with sensory impulses that, that happen like all the time. We experience somehow like stuff that's happening to us from before we're born until, we, until just after we die. Um, and this is organized in our minds into what we sort of perceive as coherent episodes, one, things, one damn thing after another. And a lot of this obviously we just like don't engage with at all, it just disappears. Uh, but a simple way of thinking about this could be like, it's, we have all of these experiences and that's our like, life experience collectively that happens there. And I think we, we all talk about experiences as something that we kind of know what it is. So we have this like intuitive feeling that this thing is an experience that we had. Um, there's often some kind of signpost or, or post or limit at the beginning and the end of, of, the, of that experience bubble uh, in, our, in our personal timeline. Uh, it can be a, something uh, geographical, it can be a spatial boundary, for instance, you enter this room and now we're like in the episode that you can call the, that very long lecture that that crazy woman had, at Knutland, for instance. So like the boundary could be a door, that could be a, a very simple example of one. But we recognize uh, this somehow in our bodies, uh, in our shifts of attention, in shifting roles and so on. And what I'm going to try and do in this talk is to translate these subconscious feelings into concepts that will feel totally obvious to you at the end. So, and I know this because I've given similar talks before, that during this you will be like, oh, and then at the end you will be like, she taught me literally nothing I did not know. And that is true, because we as humans are really good at being humans, and that is fundamentally what we're talking about here. So you all know this stuff. This is an exercise in getting some terminology, terms and concepts to be able to engage with it in an active way rather than just like in the overall way of de uh, dealing with this. And as I said, a lot of this model of thinking comes from, from LARP. Like I have learned this through looking at LARPs as sort of special instances of life. Uh, so that means that all of you are actually better qualified than the average human to think about these terms. But the moment you have this, the moment it becomes visible to you, it becomes something that you can design. So suddenly that means that you can take all of your LARP design skills and, and apply them to designing elements of life, of the real world, so to speak. What that means we will also return to. 
Um, and that's a pretty big promise. It's like basically I'm telling you that you're magicians, but like you already are. So this is like, you know, this is like, like I don't know, it's like kind of the reverse Hogwarts letter, I suppose. Like you get the Hogwarts letter and they're like, oh yeah, no, I, I always had the Hogwarts letter. You know, that's going to be the experience, I hope, for this talk. But to be able to do that, we're going to talk a little bit about normal behavior uh, and this idea of like what is no normal behavior. I'm going to show you now a picture and I would ask you if you are from uh, the Nordic countries or uh, United Kingdom or Dutch, please do not answer this question. Uh, everybody else gets to play. What is going on here? <laughs> what, what are we seeing here? Okay. Now, if you, I, d d the German can play. What, what is this? I'm seeing. Oh, what? Is yes, uh, we have two bachelorette parties there, um, and and one stag party on the left. So uh, this seems to be some kind of Northern European uh, Protestant tradition. I don't know. Probably pre-Christian. Uh, what's going on here is that before uh, you get married, uh, there uh, is. Uh, uh, and often uh, a party thrown by the friends of the bride and groom, uh, typically uh, on gendered terms, although that's different. For instance, my uh, bachelorette party was not gendered. Um, and a, a traditional element of these kinds of things is, would be public humiliation with sexual undertones. So I, probably this grows out of some kind of like fertility ritual or something like that. Nobody knows. This has been going on for a very long time. So you can see there the, the bride up in the right hand corner is dressed in a sort of bodysuit with a giant penis on it. Uh, and these ladies have gone on some kind of pink princess theme there with a big tie that says kiss me. So some kind of weird gender play is going on. Um, and very often this involves being in public places, ragingly drunk at early in the morning, kissing strangers to demonstrate that you can before you are locked down in uh, heteromonogamy for the rest of your life. Um, <laughs> that's how we celebrate. But the thing is, in Finland, if you see this cr group in the middle of the street, you would consider this to be completely normal behavior because you know that this is a hen party. Like they might be annoying, but they are not weird. It's a completely normal thing to do in this specific context. Now, how do we know that, they, that, that that's what's happening here? How do we know that this is a hen party? Anyone? Yes, Petter? As often one person is like, I am much more drunk <laughs> or very like more dressed up or like the, the kiss me thing. One p person is being kind of humiliated more, yes. And you mentioned the kiss me thing. What else can we see here? The veils, yes. So they speak of the bridal context. He doesn't have anything, but he has the, the Borat swimsuit that su suggests playfulness. Monica? I think uh, there's, at least in Copenhagen, less of the dressing up going on around, but it's a group of very entitled people who have a lot more confidence that they usually would in being very weird in a public space. That is true. And another, yes, they are entitled. And, and the reason they are, in fact, in this specific case, uh, they are playing in public, so well, and the the they are they are engaging in, in grown up play, playful behaviors, and that means that they're bringing around them what we call a magic circle, and we can all culturally, if you're from our culture, you can un read this information, and you can see that okay, no, but in, within that bubble, it's okay. They can transgress. Like I don't like strangers touching, kissing me aggressively in the street. I think that's gross. Um, so we might need to negotiate, but basically this is a normal thing. And the, the veils and the humiliating clothes and all that's very important. Those are ludic markers is the technical term. This is a visual symbol that play is happening here. So that, so that I know, oh, that's the code. Oh, like it's okay. Because normally, you know, you hear them and you're like, what the hell? And then you look, oh, oh, okay. Right. So normal behavior is relative. Uh, this dude on the right, you know, in a different kind of picture, he could be at a stag party also. I mean, maybe he's a little extra naked, but basically, like, I think you could create a stag party f framework within which that would still be within normal behavior. But I think we can also agree that this is not normal behavior in a northern European streetscape, or anywhere, probably, streetscape. Um, so this is relative stuff. So another important question here becomes, like, where is this normal behavior, normal behavior? When is this normal behavior, normal behavior? And these kinds of social agreements, which are, I will continue to emphasize completely arbitrary, they can be very different sizes. So for instance, we have one that is almost global, which is this agreement that money has value. And I know this is weird 
to think about, but of course money, objectively speaking, has no value. That's paper, very cheap, well, rather expensive paper, and rather interestingly, like, ambitiously printed, but it's still just paper, and the factual, like, production value of a hundred dollar bill is not one hundred dollars. That is not how its value is constructed. And also, in most currencies, it's not connected to a gold reserve either, even though, you know, if you build your worldview on Donald Duck, like I did, that would, what, that's what you would assume. So actually, it's just a big social agreement that money has value, and therefore it can be traded for services. Right? That is a completely fictional concept. It's like a game that the whole world plays. But occasionally, you, leave, you end up in war zones or in, in places of the world where money suddenly has no value, and then it becomes very visible that this was a random agreement that we had. Okay. Um, so um, again, if you want technical terms, I guess that would make money a simulacrum. Uh, the, the, the signifiers are just pointing at each other. It's not connected to anything in the world. Uh, what we have here is the, is the proud Nordic sport of ice hockey and a person tackling another person. And this is a pretty brutal tackle. So I guess technically it's, uh, it might be something that you might be punished for in, within the sphere of, of the ice hockey game. They might put you on a bench, for instance, for a few minutes to sit as punishment for this action. Uh, however, when we ask again, like, where is it legal to behave like this? In the hockey rink, it is legal to behave like this. And in the parking lot, the exact same two individuals in the parking lot cannot behave like this, because then it becomes a matter for the police. And these are also arbitrary rules about violence that we have set up in our uh, society. And again, it's funny, actually, with the hockey rink, because that is actually, well, it's a kind of oval, but essentially it's a, it's a magic circle. So that's the sort of core. Um, core element. And around the magic circle of the hockey rink is another magic circle of, of the stadium itself, which says that while I'm in there, I can shout at the top of my voice, for instance, curses, I mean, I wouldn't, but many people do, uh, shout uh, to the opposing team and the fans of the opposing team language that could get them fired if they did it in the office. And again, we ha consider this to be completely normal behavior. Uh, and we only become aware of it when norms are changing, so that we suddenly start to negotiate what is acceptable for football fans to do, for instance. So, so as we talked about in the beginning, any, point of, any part of, LARP, of life can be organized into these kinds of sort of small ministries. That's how we make sense of the world. Um, but when we design experiences that are designed to change people or engage people in some way, we're typically working with a very special kind of, of circle um, that we often call the magic circle, typically in video game design, but this also, like, ultimately it comes from anthropology. So we say that within a specific time and space, time and specific space, we have different social rules inside the thing and different consequences uh, of the actions. Different relationships between the parties inside it, the circle um, and, um, and different norms for behavior. Uh, and these are not universal inside the, the magic circle either. So for instance, the behaviors that are available inside school and outside school are uh, different regardless of whether you're a student, a teacher, a janitor or a lunch lady. But of course, they don't have identical uh, agency inside the school. Inside the school, they do different things, and outside the school, they also do different things, right? But the limit has, has an effect on all of them because the social role changes in that context. Um, we also already talked about the hockey game. So in most uh, cultures, we find it normal for people to dress funny and adopt another name and pretend relationships on the theater stage, which is also one of our like, historically very strong magical circles. But we do get a little bit judgmental if people dress up in animal costumes and go shopping for groceries, for instance. Or if you see them like, in a hotel lobby, you might think you're at a fur furry convention, and then you make all kinds of deductions about that that you wouldn't if the same, same person was standing on a theater stage. And in human history, of course, the foundational magic circle is the ritual. So we have agreements in all human cultures, including all contemporary modern human cultures, even though they're typically invisible to us because that's the culture we live in, that, that inside magic circles, words uttered by someone in a specific role, in a specific kind of place, can change, for instance, the legal status of humans in the eyes of society. So here is the Swedish church wedding, and, and standing in front of this couple is a human in like, probably like a man in a long dress, or magic wizard's robes, we could call them. We, of course, call them priests, and, and those, those robes have other, um, um, other names. 
And in the ritual, the person ha there has to be a ring. The magic object is mandatory for the wedding to be legal. Like it could be a rubber band, but the object needs to be there or it doesn't happen. And then they say some specific words. And you can change everything else about the wedding ceremony. I mean, the church doesn't like it, but theoretically you could. But the one league, there's a one sentence there that is the legal requirement or the magic does not work. The transformation in the eyes of the law doesn't work. So this is not something that is like, okay, so I'm, I'm, not, I'm just going to say right now that if you have primitive cultures in your mind, like just drop that idea because we're all primitive cultures. Like that's, we're, it's, it's, just a, it's just a surface that's different, right? So now we've said uh, that we talked a little bit about the magic circle, but of course immediately it needs to become more complicated. So I would like you to think in your mind about how long is your experience of this Knutpunkt? On which day does Knutpunkt begin? Does it begin on Thursday afternoon? Maybe. Does it begin when you arrive in Oslo? Maybe. Petter. Announcement of next event. Announcement of next event. Maybe, yeah. Or does it begin the first time you hear that something such as Knutpunkt begins? Or does it begin the first time <laughs> that you go to your first LARP? That sounds like a little bit too early. But when you hear about Knutpunkt, I think that's probably the point when your experience of ultimately going to Knutpunkt starts taking shape. That, that everything that happens from that point on kind of affects what you're doing. When does it end? Can Knutpunkt ever end? <laughs> it might never end. I am not joking. Like, it might be until the day you die, you will be here. You can check out, check in, but you can, you can check out, but you can never leave, right? <laughs> um, so again, an, an experience exists in space. Where is Knutpunkt? Where is Knutpunkt currently happening? It's, it, it's happening at Mastemur Hotel. I think it might also be happening in the bodies of people who really w are, are yearning to be here, people who are like checking social media in, in Tokyo and Brazil and, 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 and all around the Nordic countries and all around Europe and the US and are like, I wonder what they're doing right now or is there any live streaming? Like it might be going on in their bodies as well in all of those places. And of course there are, are experiences that are entirely virtual when they're happening in servers that nobody knows where they are and in your computer and in your body, for instance. Um, an experience is narrative structure because we move through time and space, like we talked about, it's inevitable. Uh, and typically we organize them, let's say, th these are all simplifications, but for the purpose, this purpose, beginning, middle and end, and in the middle something changes. And we make these stories in our lives, and sometimes it's easy, and it's this <laughs> coherence. But often, like, again, where do we draw the line? Like, this would have to be a hell of an, of a, of a, lecture for you to think that this is a, like an experience in itself. In all likelihood, you know, let's be real, this is probably going to like, in your memory, it's going to fade into like the overall like tra -la -la of the background noise of stuff you heard at Knutpunkt. And then maybe the experience that you remember afterwards will be about, about Knutpunkt. But I could have done some things to make this particular experience more memorable. I could have stood at the door and like shaken your hand and made eye contact and be like, hi, welcome, I'm really happy you're here. I am, by the way, really happy that you're here, <laughs> but I was busy. Um, so now, okay, an experience also has a social dynamic. So someone, uh, this is much, like, already we're controversial. Now I'm like, now I'm just in making shit up country. I posit that an experience has a social ex dynamic. You can experience things alone, of course, but then the solitude is part, like then that is the social dynamic of that, is that you are not with people, and that adds some other kind of, of meaning there. But generally, experiences have some kind of social uh, dynamics. So I'm just going to do like a really small ex uh, um, practical ex uh, ex um, example. This is from, I think, a Dutch museum of play. It's an installation where uh, it's a dance installation. So that's, there's a heat camera in the back, and then it makes these beautiful images of like your body as you're moving in the room. And, and they got some nice 11 year olds to pose for this picture to see how much fun it is to be in this installation. Now everyone understands that obviously if you go to this museum and you're not 11 years old and being forced to pose, you would not be dancing in this installation because it's totally embarrassing, right? And this is exactly what happened, which was kind of sort, sort of sad because they had made this nice installation. Uh, and then they thought about that and they uh, fixed it by turning off the lights because the heat camera doesn't care. So suddenly you're dancing in the dark. So the social dynamic has changed. You make a physical change in the room, the social dynamic changes, and the experience of the thing changes entirely. Um, and the reason I say that, that even when you're 
alone it has a social dynamic, is that if you were in the room and the lights were on, would you dance when you're alone? Petter would. I would probably, <laughs> I would probably do like this. Like I'd dance just a little bit, but I would still have the shame of somebody potentially seeing me. It would be just as strong as though they're not in the room. Okay, let's do some experience design exercises. Have you ever been, have you ever in your life had a bad experience at a party? Have you gone to a party and not had the kind of fun that you were hoping for? <laughs> yes, okay. I would like you to think of one specific aspect of something that made it not fun and just tell it to the next person. That should take no more than 20 seconds, go. Let's just do two or three. Um, a bad experience, could somebody would like to share one? Or, or you can just shout. Uh, inviting people to party and no one showing up. No one showing up, yes? That's terrible, that's terrible already. I was like, oh, anything else, yeah? Mark, sorry? Putting a big table in the middle of the dance floor. Yes? <laughs> Mismatch of core values. Mismatch of core values, ooh. Exist showing up. X is showing up. Oh, so many problems, right? Okay, this can just go on and on. Um, but I mean, I, often it's a, it's a core design problem as well. Let's think about like if we if we were now tasked with making a party in this room and we have like very little time, what would be the first things we would think of? Like, what would we do to make to turn this into a party? Music, music, music yes. Move the chairs. Move the chairs, yes. Lights. Lights. Okay, and where would we move the chairs? Corners. Corners, walls, yeah. Already you have very different ideas of what this is. Some people are thinking we need the space to dance, and some people are thinking we need the space to talk. Uh, if your goal is to make people dance, dance for very important, as is the light, not too bright. Um, and if your goal is also that people will talk, then the volume in this one room, the volume of the music will immediately create a problem between your two design goals. You want the car, do you want the kind of party where people talk or the kind of party where people dance? dance like parties, by the way, are the most easy like experience design thing because we all have so much experience of it being terrible. In northern countries, you expect, especially if you're a Finn, that you go to a party or a dinner party and you will be uncomfortable. Like It will be bad for the first hour and a half because we, uh, we don't even have a small talk culture. Like We literally cannot speak about nothing, so we're just going to sit there awkwardly and be like this and drink until everybody is so drunk that it works anyway. <laughs> I'm not joking, unfortunately. But we could solve this with better design. But I mean, it's, I'm very happy that you didn't say decorations and snacks, because I promise you when I speak to people in municipalities, that's what they're like, we could have some chips in a bowl. Yeah. <laughs> And here already it's evening, so it's easier. It's easier at quarter to seven on a Saturday night to turn this room into a party than it is of, in an office, you know, where I might be lecturing on 11 a.m. on a Monday morning. And th there's no, not enough chips in the world to turn that into a party. And that has to do <laughs> with the social expectations around how you be behave at work, you, where, you know, which are quite different to social expectations at how you behave at Knudepunkt, where we have institutionalized the one-hour party as a thing, right? But the core ex question in all experience design, I am yelling because this is super important. This is also true for every LARP you make. One question is more important than any other question, and it is what kinds of activities will my participants be doing? And you can break the, if your answer is role play or enjoy, no. Those are kind of states. Will they interact? What? You know, oh, so many artists, no offense artists, but a lot of artists are like, we will want them to interact in the space. No, that, no, I'm finished. Like, I, that does not, no. <laughs> There needs to be something specific for me to do and it needs to be possible and it needs to be something I want to do. Watch, make choices, listen. Already now we're closer. But dance, that's very specific. I can work with that. You know the, the, the social like design function of the chips bowl is that you have somewhere to hang around and keep your hands busy and your mouth full so that you're, it's okay that you don't have small talk. That is why we have crisps at parties. Yes. So. Um, designing an experience is being aware of the meanings uh, that compete and interact in the physical and social space. And those are all, all the time they are uh, connected. Um, and I, I'm also going to make this claim, which is a little bold, which, but I believe it to be true. The opposite of design in, in practical terms, like not maybe theoretically, but in practice, the opposite of design is tradition. So we have these traditional ideas of how something is done. Um, and there are meanings that we attach to certain symbols and behaviors, and those have developed iteratively over time, sometimes because there was some like, real need, and we started to doing things in a, in a real way for ritual reasons or for practical reasons, and then positive or meaningful values attached itself to that, and then that's how we do it, because that's just how we do it in our culture. And, you know, and, and every time you go to a bad party, 
that doesn't work, where it's impossible for like, people hate each other or they can't talk or you have to be drunk to be able to interact and then everything goes wrong because everyone is too drunk, all of those things. It's because instead of designing a party, somebody has recreated a party with the, sim the symbols of the party in a traditional manner instead of thinking of what are we trying to achieve here. And by the way, if you're new to design, basically design is the answer to like, you think, you ask yourself, what are we trying to achieve here? And then you do the steps to achieve that thing. And that is what we call design. Um, now, tradition is not bad. <laughs> I mean, if you go to a dinner party, which is super awkward and it's torture from beginning to end, obviously that is a bad experience, but that doesn't mean that, that the traditional ways of making dinner parties are necessarily wrong. Tradition, the traditional dinner parties in a specific like, socioeconomic context of whatever that is, is a skill. And for the people who know how to play that game, that can be an awesome experience. Like, I'm going to talk to me. I don't know if you watch Downton Abbey, but you talk to the person on your left and, and during the first course, and then everybody turns to the other direction and talks to the person in the other. Like, the rules are really clear. If you know how to play that game, and if you come from a culture that has small talk, you're fine. If you're me and you're sent to England for your education, you're screwed. But in theory, it, you know, there's nothing wrong with traditions. Tradition, cultural agreement, cultural shorthand is really useful. The game designer Teresa Axner has a wonderful term uh, called herd competence, which is like a shorthand for the available resources of social scripts, cultural context, expectations, uh, ex applicable experience and tradition that dominate in the participant group. So if you are, you know, a count in the 20s and you're running, you're throwing a, a dinner party for people from your own social standards, then the herd competence of how to be at that dinner party is very high. And then if, you know, somebody, the Irish driver has suddenly joined your family, he is not going to know how to do that. And then that's going to be like a design problem. Uh, but often, you know, you can absolutely, absolutely use this. Like Eric said, I think, in his talk uh, yesterday, like the, most, the, the resource, the hard limit of LARP design is how much new information can the players learn for the purpose of your LARP. And if they have to learn, like, everything, if you change everything about how we act in the world, you can, by the way, because you're a magician now and you can do that. Like, we can design every surface. We can change everything about how the world works. I mean, I guess the biological limits. We're not going to be talking with our asses. But basically, up to that point, we can change everything. But it's too difficult for the players to learn for your three-hour LARP. So we're not going to make that decision. So we're going to use some of these shorthands. And herd competence is very useful to think of, like, what are the assumptions of my player base? Oh, I'm just going to design with that for now. The other good thing about the herd is that the herd can carry the people who don't know it. So, like, if you go to a LARP and you're a new LARPer, but most of the other people are LARPers, they know how to role play. And that's a skill. But you can just like look at the other people and like, okay, this is role playing apparently, and then you just mimic that, and then you learn how to role play. That's how most of us learned how to role play. If you are running a LARP for people who have never role played before, they will not know necessarily how to do this unless you build it into to the procedure somehow. Uh, there are also limitations. I'm going to return to those uh, in a little while. But I talked about this. You can change everything in the world. Uh, and that is an over, overwhelming responsibility of understanding designable surfaces, like ex ex especially inside your LARP. You know, there is nothing that you cannot create. Like, you make the world, you make the universe, you make the culture, you make the who the people are. You can make anything you want. And that's like an endless job, <laughs> of course. Like, you have to make choices. Thank God design is making uh, choices. Um, but when you don't make a choice, Someone, someone else makes the choice. And the typical way is that you inherit the traditional and the physical and social environments that are already present among your players or in the room. And you in inherit traditions and assumptions and prejudices and preconceptions. Anything that you don't decide, the players will bring whatever they have to work with. And that might be very different things, which could be useful or or a disaster, or it could be all the same thing, which might be different from the thing that you're trying to achieve, and that could also be a disaster. Okay. To make this even more complicated, the participant is the protagonist of the story, that means the main character, but also the author of the story. So now suddenly when we're thinking about LARP as a kind of storytelling medium, I want to tell stories in this medium, I want to enable at least stories in this medium, but I don't get to tell the stories because the storytelling is told by somebody else, this participant who comes into this world. So I don't even get to decide exactly what they're going to experience because that's happening inside their body and their mind. So that sets a whole other level of difficulty to this thing. 
And this, uh, uh, if you're come from, coming from theater, or if you're coming from digital games, um, this is actually something that's very difficult to sort of comprehend. And certainly, if, if you're a writer like me, like, I, I won't tell the stories. I want them to do my <laughs> stories. No, then you're in the wrong medium. Then you should maybe make your piece in some other way. What we do is we invite, like, we create the world and the, and the potential for the story, and we invite people to explore it. And then we get to manipulate it uh, when we can, which is like this. I can affect the story, I can steer the story, I can inspire the story, and the way you do that is you do it through the selection and design of physical and social environments. Yes, so this is where it gets interesting. What is the physical environment? It is everything that has a physical presence in the world uh, or affects the senses automatically, like sound and temperature and smell. And. Um, and I'm, I'm a little bit surprised about how the next slide looks, so let's see how this works. But it's interesting where we're going. Uh, but the content is right. <laughs> the content is right. So, yeah, uh, often you can't affect the, the, the temperature of your venue. But that could be a deal breaker for your game. The, these are also choices. Like, you know, you run a thing at a convention, they give you a room, that's the room you have. You can't make any other choice. Like, it's that or nothing. Uh, then you may have to design something else, but at least you can move the chairs to the corner or the middle or the walls, depending on what you're trying to do. Okay. So the control questions that we have, I don't know, like we totally changed genres here. Control questions that you can ask yourself uh, about the design of the physical space are like this. What does it feel like to be here? What can people do here? So please notice, I'm not saying what does it look like? I mean, that's also very all, all good and well. It might be important for the atmosphere of fiction. But these, when we're looking at designing like participatory works where people actually make some actions, these are the questions you should ask yourself. What can people not do here? Who am I in this space? How long would I like to stay here? Can I leave wherever I want to? Where should I go next? Um, and the way you design the, the physical environment is through balancing objects and structures and spaces and light and sound and, and temperature and and all of that stuff. Uh, then we have the social environment, which is everything that... I, I'm, I'm very surprised at these slides. It's going to be very exciting to see if they, if they come again and look better next time. Uh, the social environment is everything that affects our agency and actions, like expectations, status, hierarchies, micro and macro hierarchies, social roles, values, and cultural norms. And now you may be like, wait, what? Like, how do I even design these things? Like, how do I design status hierarchy or social <laughs> roles. Well, I mean, and I, I'm, importantly, I'm not talking now about the social roles and hierarchies inside the fiction. I mean, I am talking about those, but I'm also talking about the social roles and hierarchies outside of the fiction. You enter, let's say that we're going to play a, a LARP in this room, and we all come in here, and, in a little, and we like, interact, and in a little while we're going to start the game. There are two completely different sets of hierarchies happening here. One is, how comfortable are you in this room as a player? And the other is, how comfortable is your character in the fictional room they are? But these are happening at the same time, because both of these levels of reality, so to speak, are, are occurring at the same time. Yes? Yeah. What's the difference between micro and macro um, Well, it, it, in brief, in this context, I think we can just say that, like, uh, a micro example here could be, like, some of you are tall and and tall people are assumed to have authority, so other people will defer to them. Here I have a social role of like speaker while your audience, so that's a, micro, a relatively micro hierarchy. But there are also uh, global structures, like patriarchy, for instance, that could have uh, effects in, or that do have effect in the room, or white supremacy, these kinds of, these kinds of very sort of top level uh, things. That, that all the baggage, like if it exists in the world, this room is also the world. Like that stuff doesn't stop being true inside here, just because I'm gonna try and run a LARP and we're all friends, or whatever. Uh, that stuff is also present. Um, the social uh, environment is designed through rules and suggestions and the physical environment. So now already, like, keep in mind, we're talking about the rules of the LARP, but also about the rules of the players around the LARP and how we ex interact with each other. So some questions here would be, what is the atmosphere in this space? Who is the decider here? What is my role among these people? What is my function in this process? Can I choose what I will do here? Do I feel safe here? And will this be embarrassing? And now I can tell you, by the way, that this will be embarrassing because we are working from a slide of a version of my slides that is about two hours old. Good thing I know this stuff pretty well, but it's not going to be pretty. I'm very sorry about that. Okay. Um, again, so you can you can come into a space physically as a human, 
And, and we are so good at this stuff. Like, we can read rooms. We know if we're welcome. Sometimes we think we're not welcome even when we are welcome, right? But we know this stuff. And you enter a place and you're like, how can I ever LARP with these people? How can I ever interact with these people? And that is something that we can design. Like, the quality of your LARP is very important. But the ability to play the LARP is just as much affected by this stuff. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about something that's super important. We're now, by the way, at point three of my lectures. We have covered two of the areas, I'm now realizing. Um, um, yeah. So a really important question that you can ask yourself uh, is, is my experience designed for humans? We can tell now that the slide isn't designed for, for designers. But the question <laughs> <laughs> clearly is, is valid. Uh, you would think that when humans make uh, experiences that they would be aimed at humans, but for some reason that is rarely the case. If you have, for instance, ever interacted with public health care, uh, you know, or any kind of health care, you know that this is uh, um, something that people aren't very good at. So, um, the, the Maslow's hierarchy of needs is like in many ways a problematic not, uh, model or whatever, uh, but it is a kind of useful checklist. So if, you just, if you're just looking at an, an, at an experience you're designing, it's good to have this at the back of your mind. Like the, the top level stuff where it's a self-actualization, pursue inner talent, creativity, fulfillment. A lot of the flow state stuff for change and, and stuff that we want to happen in LARPs is happening up at the top of the pyramid. The theory is that all of this other stuff needs to be in place for that to be able to happen. So food, water, shelter, warmth, and I will also put bathrooms at under cycle physiological there at the bottom level. So for any of that other stuff to be able to happen, people need to be not too cold, not too hot, not too hungry, not too thirsty, and not too desperate to pee. <laughs> the next level is freedom from fear. And fear can be very many things. It can be doing taxis, talking to stranger, being found out as a fraud. People always talk about tigers in this context, but not in our you know, society that is not, no longer tigers. Um, so if your participants are feeling uncertain, confused, awkward, uncomfortable, or lost, we're failing on the second level. And it means that the immersion cannot happen, like the enjoyment cannot happen, the transformation cannot happen, your political uh, message cannot happen for that participant. Some of them might still be having a good time. And this bleeds also into belonging, like am I physically in the right place? Then up there on the self-esteem level, also very important, what is right and what is wrong here? That's what I was talking about, the social environment. Who has the power to change what is right and wrong? Um, a friend of mine just bought an apartment, and uh, I'm, I'm just going to think which part of this is most vital to tell because I have so much on my mind. Okay, basically, I, I know someone who, as a child, has a rich friend and went to the rich friend's house. They were, this kid was eight years old. And he went to, on a play date to this, to this fancier apartment and went to the bathroom. And then this child, who was the guest in the home, got told off by the friend's mother and said, you use the private bathroom. You're a guest in this house. You should use the guest bathroom. Is this reasonable treatment of a child? No, obviously not. But what happened here was that the child was, was, was in the role of guest. And then the rules, the, there were secret rules that weren't shared. And then the child was humiliated and said, you have now failed at the role of guest. And not only is that a shit play date, but it also means that like, you might be, the, the role of guest in a nice home might be closed for you forever, because the, yeah, there's no way you're going to enter those spaces where you know you will be doing things wrong, whether you like it or not. There are many things that the mother could have done, and I'm going to tell you what they are. They're obvious what they are. However, it wasn't obvious to that mother, because in her role, I'm sure, Everybody knows the distinction between the private bathroom and the guest bathroom. This was also, I should say, if this is new to you, it was also new to me when I was told this story. How to behave in a specific setting is never obvious. Never, ever. Unless, possibly, unless you're making something that isn't interesting to anyone. By which I mean that if you have a bunch of people who have the exact same experiences and expectations, and they do something that they do all do all the time, like we're all going to walk down a corridor to get to, to the meal, we don't need any special design for that because we've all walked, you know, we know how to walk down a corridor towards a destination. But if you're do doing anything more advanced than that, then what is normal behavior is not obvious. And it's because people have different backgrounds, uh, but also social skills and bodies and experiences and expectations, and some are shy and some are not neurotypical. Everybody 
everybody benefits from clear instructions, but to be able to give clear instructions, we need to be aware of what we're taking for granted. You can, by the way, also use this stuff uh, in a more complex manner. So, for instance, if we're thinking about it in terms of agency, agency is affected at different levels. Let's think about the party again. If you want to make a party where, the, where people dance, that's a very broad goal. So, if you want to make a party where the cool and beautiful people can dance like crazy, that's not very hard. If you want to make a party where everybody feels like it's okay for them to dance, that's slightly harder. And if you want to make a party where everybody feels that they are the cool and beautiful people, <laughs> that is even harder. But of course, that's the most valuable goal if you make a party for people that you want to be happy. Uh, and then it's operating on different levels, like what kinds of things can happen in this place, but also who can I be where such things are happening? Like what is, is it, um, um, yes, the role of crazy dancing is available in this space, is it available to me individually in this space? Uh, and again, if the basics is, aren't in place, then it's not going to work. So now what I'm going to do uh, is I'm going to talk a little bit about how LARP design has, uh, has developed and how, how the practice of thinking about experience design in this manner uh, has given us like, some new analytical tools to think about LARP design in, an, in another structural way. And then I'm going to talk about some practical things towards the end. Okay. So. So yeah, what is normal behavior and what is tradition? That's where we're coming from. Uh, 20 years ago, I learned uh, in the keynote yesterday that one of the things that somebody said when they invented the idea of what would become Knutpunkt was, if people from different LARP groups would talk together, maybe there would be an exponential development of like LARP in the Nordic countries. That could totally happen. I think there was Hanne Krasmo who said it at the time. It is visionary because that is indeed what happened. And to be more specific, what happened is that in the mid to late 90s, everyone in the Nordic countries who was doing LARP, I think everybody in the world who was doing LARP, was doing it in a local tradition, which had relatively little influence of each other. What happened was that anywhere in the world where tabletop, where tabletop games were played in the 70s and 80s, LARP was invented independently. So LARP seems to be like an inevitable consequence of playing tabletop games. Uh, uh, in the late 70s and early 80s. And with, by everybody, I mean small, small clusters of people in, on all continents <laughs> figured this out. Then some things happened. Uh, the Brits uh, had their, whatever it's called, treasure trap or something that was being reported in gamer magazines, which were at that time on paper. Um, and people were reading them and, go, and looking at the pictures, but they didn't explain how LARP works, but you could see somebody in a costume and you went like, oh, okay, no, yeah, I get it, I get it, I can do that. The other is there was a film called Mazes and Monsters with Tom Hanks, which was like really influential, which was a moral panic film about how LARP is really dangerous. But at least in Finland, that was screened on a, like a specific date in the early 80s. And then LARP was independently invented in many places in Finland because people looked at this film about how dangerous role playing is and went like, wait a minute, that sounds fantastic, and did that. <laughs> but basically, since everybody had to figure it out on their own, they just started dressing up and like, inventing, like guessing at, playing at what LARPing could be, and then they did that. And then, and so that means that they're all, they all had like a, a local tradition, and they were all developing games independently in that tradition. And then when they started talking to each other, they were like convinced that they all had the right answer. In fact, in the early years of Knudepunkt, we were convinced that we were all doing the same thing. I think it took me literally three years to figure out that when anybody from the other country said the word character, they meant what they meant had no relationship to what I meant when I had character, when I said character, which is, by the way, a really useful piece of information because it means that all of the previous years when I have thought that everybody else in the Nordic countries is a bleeding idiot who speaks inco incoherently about stuff that isn't even possible, it's because the words literally meant something, that we, something else than we thought. So that was a, an interesting uh, challenge because people who thought that there is one way to do something were bumping up against all of these other ways of doing something and all of these other people were just as convinced that their way of making LARPs was the best. Age of manifestos <laughs> enters. But very soon, when you have some pretty smart and convincing people verbalizing arguments for why their way of making LARPs is the best, the natural next step is to say, wait, maybe these are both good in different ways. Maybe you can use this tool for this purpose and this tool for this purpose. Pretty obvious, but... <laughs> Again, like this took us some years to figure out. <laughs> we were also, many of us were teenagers. 
So very rapidly after that, it was like, oh, oh, okay. So depending on what kinds of LARPs I wanna make, I can use different tools to make different kinds of LARPs. So wait, I can make different kinds of LARPs? Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> so we spent a lot of time developing those tools and testing those tools and making, you know, comparing and fighting about them and about what outcomes were good and so on. And we spent basically 15 years pretty much perfecting this stuff. So LARP design is pretty much about world characters, relationships, setting culture, simulation mechanics, interaction mechanics, rules, agency, costumes and sets. Pretty much. You can make whatever choice is there, but that's pretty much it. I think at this convention, there are probably at least 200 people who are so skilled at this that you can just like put them in a room and give them some time and some paper or whatever, and they're going to come out with like a really solid design for a LARP that has, they've made some choices and they've made some really like, they've chosen some tools and they've designed some things and they've invented some new stuff and then they're going to make a really good uh, work. There's some really good work based on that. So the frustrating thing in the last 10 years has been that even though we got as a community better and better and better at being designers, because when we invented new shit, we told each other, so everybody's toolkit was getting better all the time, LARPs were still being bad. And even more mysteriously, sometimes really bad LARPs, like objectively bad LARPs, produced very good experiences for the participants. <laughs> this is mysterious. <laughs> I mean, it's not entire, I mean, we all experience, experientially, we know this is true. You go to a LARP and you're like, this is a shining turd. Like nothing is working. I am so hungry. The design is terrible. Like every choice they've made is, is prohibiting me from trying, it's trying to stop me actively, like distracting me from the goals that they have said that this LARP has. Even so, it's sometimes fantastic. Now, one of the reasons, obviously, when we, well, for a long time we said, oh, well, you know, Players are really talented at, at saving shit. And that is true, thank God. Because when we make bad choices, it's wonderful that the players are very motivated for the LARP to work, because they're there playing it now. So they're gonna fix a lot of stuff that we're not very good at. That also enables us to be lazy, so we need to self-monitor a little bit uh, on this. But with time, we said, but wait a minute, there's something wrong here. So we, th th we started to think about like, if we go a little bit back in time, like it can't all be about what happens during the LARP. And I'm sorry, but the next diagram I have drawn with my finger, <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna walk you through this. And I'm, I should tell you that this is the final slide. Like this wasn't gonna be any prettier than this. <laughs> um, it's just because it's such a hassle. So like I haven't, I'm so bad at computer drawing, so I'm not gonna, but there's a prettier version of it coming later in the presentation. Okay, so this is a timeline uh, from, <laughs> from left to right. So in the sort of left corner of the eye-shaped thing, there's a small uh, pale blue letter A, and that A stands for announcement. And, and around, even before the announcement, there's a little squiggle, and that squiggle is you are sitting in a bar talking to somebody about your LARP idea. And between, so you, you have some idea about your LARP, and maybe you do some pre-work and stuff, and like you maybe already, maybe you do some design even. This is actually kind of from the participant's perspective. So they come into this. Their experience starts when you announce the LARP. And then, I don't know what's going on up there. And then, we, this is the timeline, and the circle in the middle is the magic circle of the LARP itself. Like that is the runtime, that's when the, the game is being played, and that's when the players are mostly in character. Mostly, I say, because they, you may be using meta techniques, they might be going to the bathroom off game, like there are all kinds of things that might be happening when they are not, in fact, uh, in character. And, as you see here, between the announcement and the runtime, it says LARP preparation and player selection. Sometimes that involves workshops. Then you have some like, then we're on location. You can see the, up, up there, you're on location. You gather the players in some place. There are some informal activities. Then there are some form, formal activities. Then the runtime of the, of the LARP itself. And then after the runtime ends, there are some formal activities and then there are often some informal activities and then the players go home. And then the afterlife of your LARP starts, which is, we've now established as an experience that goes on possibly forever. But problematically enough, sometimes, like for instance, the story of what your LARP was isn't at all an affair between you and your players. Like all kinds of other people have opinions about your LARP and what it was. That's the blue lines at the end. So that's like people are talking about your LARP. That starts when you announce the LARP at the latest. 
And then people are telling all kinds of stories of what your LARP is and what it means and what kind of experience it's totally going to be and what it was and what happened there and what absolutely happened there that was very bad and should never have happened there and so on. And actually the worst time for that is that when you're running your LARP, people are talking about your LARP, forming all kinds of you know, opinions that you have no control over because you're in the LARP, like running the LARP. And then your player come out, players come out and in the worst case there's been some kind of shitstorm on the internet that they are now coming out into. And their image of like what they've just experienced might even be shaped by something that happened completely beyond your control. And I was like, oh, this is a little bit tr tr troublesome because clearly I can't control the opinion of everyone in the universe f for my LARP to be good. So that seems uh, problematic. And yes, no, it's a bit of a challenge, <laughs> obviously, because in fact you can't. But I think if we want to say, if we want to think about like what the journey of the participant is through this experience, there are many things that affect this experience that are not about like the quality of your fighting mechanics. And I think if we just think about this as a timeline, let's think for a second about the concept of disappointment. If people are disappointed in your LARP, when are they disappointed? What are some times when they can be disappointed? When the food runs out. When the food runs out. Better. When you get new information that it does not match with the information you have got before. Yes. When your characters or the information you get before the LARP is incomprehensible. Yes. When they find out how much it costs. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, so one thing that is the disappointment, like fundamentally, per definition, it is that there was some kind of expectation that is then not met. So that means that, you know, if the, if the disappointment happens on site, then the problem has happened before the LARP has started. So if we are only designing for what is happening when the players are playing the LARP, then clearly we are not designing for anything that causes them disappointment, unless we give them continuously new expectations. So uh, in the, the phase before you step into the actual magic circle of the thing, that is when all the disappointment happens. And as you have, all your good examples have established, there are so many steps where they can be disappointed, unfortunately. But I'm going to re return a little bit to, to how this happens. I would also say that at the end of that beautiful, beautiful diagram, after the runtime, that whole part is just as important. We're going to see a nicer version of this soon. After the LARP, the playing ends, that's basically when the reflection happens. And a very good thing to know about this thing with, with the participant being the storyteller is that the participant, while they are playing the LARP, you know, if you have act breaks, this might work a little bit differently, but basically while they are playing, they are not really constructing the full story. It's, they are living the LARP. They're organizing the experiences that they're having as they're having them. Only after they have exited the story do they put a nice little bow on it and go like, okay, this was the story of my character, this, is what, this was the story of the LARP. I'm experiencing the LARP, then I'm telling the story, but the storytelling of my character is happening after. And it's not happening just with me, it's happening in conversation with other players. In whatever framework you provide at the end of the LARP, formal or informal, that's when the negotiations around the story happen. That is when the story of the LARP is essentially told. That is also when the story of whether your LARP is any good happens, typically. So if two thirds or one third or a very loud 10% of your players have a miserable experience, they might taint the experience of the other 90% as well. Eric Fatlan said, uh, LARP is a fictional society inside a temporary society inside something else, but basically it means a continuous uh, society. So another way that we can think about this, like, so you just saw a timeline of like how LARP works, but if we're not thinking about the norms and behaviors that are operating in many levels, um, uh, in, in any experience design. You can also think about them as a sort of, as nested magic circles, in a sense. Uh, so for all of these societies, they all have norms and so on. And inside each society, there are all of these little cultural bubbles. So like inside the fictional society, there's how do we do weddings in this village, in this fantasy LARP. But in the, in the next circle, it can be like, how do we as the players at this LARP act when we disagree about the rules, for instance, or how do we as humans in the country where this is happening interact uh, with fire in public places. 
So I'm just going to do like one specific example because that's how I started to think about this myself because I do a lot of work in participation safety. And for the longest time, when we were thinking about like how do we make our LARP safe, we were inside that game design circle, which is the green there. I know it's a beautiful diagram. Uh, the, the game design circle. And then we were saying, oh, okay, so we need like calibration mechanics and simulation mechanics. So we should probably use like real swords. Let's use pretend like plastic swords. That's a simulation mechanic. Or like we should probably have some kind of system for figuring out which of the players want to be hit really hard and which only want to be hit kind of hard. That's a calibration mechanic. And also event safety was something that we did actually quite early on, even if we didn't think about them in those terms. Like, like somebody should maybe be char in charge of us not burning the forest down. That could be a good thing. Uh, these days, if you design safe safety systems for your LARP, you have to design on all of these levels, right? So you're designing the stuff that happens inside the fiction during play, during runtime. How do the players interact with each other and with the fiction? You're designing their experience, uh, which has to do with establishing cultural norms and set behaviors and rules for how the players interact with each other before, during and after your event, and also how they interact with the off-game environment. But around that, we also have this thing with community norms and community design, which is just as important. And if we think about it, if we break it out in the timeline, there are expectations in your community that may be very different, you know, depending on, on what your communities are. But, but when you, okay, so it's going to be like this. And then when you say something else, for instance, Ben, you say the ticket price will be, I don't know what it is, $300. And then they're like, oh, no, we think a LARP should cost $35. We are disappointed. <laughs> So then that means, basically, that if you want them to not be disappointed, you need to design community expectations that there are in the world LARPs that are worth $300. And that's the only way you can, you can avoid that disappointment is to, is, to dis is to completely change the culture around how we understand what a LARP is, for instance. That's a pretty tall order. But, I mean, but it's not an unsolvable problem. Okay. Um, so... When we talk about LARP design, and I use this all the time, this is very convenient shorthand, what we often mean is kind of runtime design. So broadly speaking, and when people are portraying characters, then we're thinking about questions like what will happen in the LARP and what will participants be doing like, while they play, which is super important. And if that is what you want to learn more about, I'm sorry to have kept you for almost an hour and a half already. Tomorrow at 6.15, you go to Bjarke's lecture, and that's when all the practical tools around this come. But we really had this idea for the longest time, and I think I have also internalized it. So I still believe that if I just design all of this stuff really well, then the players will do what I have decided that they should do, and they're going to love it because I've just made a beautiful design, and it's a really awesome LARP, and it's going to be great. <sighs> Goddamn participants, it's not great. And it's even harder when we run LARPs for non-LARPers or for people from different LARP communities. And we, we are an international community now. People travel from all over to LARPs all over. So there is nothing that can be taken for, for, for granted. And it's not because like Finnish LARPers or Italian LARPers or Belarusian LARPers or American LARPers are LARPing wrong. It's because in human life, you can never take anything for granted because all cultural behaviors, all of them, including like the value of money and when to wear a hat, are completely arbitrary and different from situation to situation, even within a, the same culture. Um, weirdly, there is another pretty new medium that is much better at this, or has become much better at this, and it's about exactly as old as LARP. Uh, it's digital games. In digital games, when you, op when you start playing a new <laughs> game of any kind, like, the basic assumption is that the game will teach you how to play the game. And, and if you're really old, you'll remember a time when that was actually not entirely... You know, for instance, you had to read a manual, or, or you had to just fiddle around with it, or it was, an, it was like a, um, um, a language interface uh, role-playing game, a text-based role-playing game in English written by a Finn. So if you can't write English with Finnish syntax, <laughs> then you can't play the game. Those things happen, like in the beginning, there were, we had these kinds of problems, but now we have pretty much established that this is kind of how like, the game will teach you how to play the game. And, and it can be a tutorial or it can be implicit, it can be built into the thing. And of course, this is also true 
uh, for like many other kinds of games. So if I buy a, a, a contemporary board game, there will be a little booklet that says this is how you set up the board and this is how you do this thing and this is how you play the, play the thing and here's a little cheat sheet that you can keep at hand while you're playing because it's complicated. If you buy a chess set, interestingly, there are very rarely the rules of chess included. How do we learn chess in our many cultures? Parents. Parents, yeah. <laughs> Parents or school. So we have, in, we have a tradition in our, cult, in our cultures, uh, almost all over the world, that chess is taught through apostolic succession, basically. <laughs> and, and, and Arkham Horror is taught through manual. In many media, with many forms of works or many kinds of experiences, the knowledge is so culturally ingrained that we take it for granted. We're like, okay, this is how you read a book. I know how to read a book because I, taught, I was taught to read a book as a child. But it is not obvious, and we, it is interestingly, like when, when manga comics uh, had a big breakthrough in, in, uh, in Europe, uh, and, and they came from Japan, and they were read from, from right to left on the page, as well as, as in the book itself, you had to have a little manual in the book. Like you could, of course, turn them around, but it's so expensive and time-consuming, so it was easier just to teach the audience how to read sort of the wrong way around. But then they entered, in, they entered a little little manual into the book. This is how you read this book. That's a really useful thing to do. But it's a very surprising thing to do because this makes it visible for us that we all take for granted how to read a book normally. Uh, normal then being obviously a completely relative term. Okay. So now you get to, we have now proceeded to the slightly prettier version that now collapses the two diagrams. So we have nested magic circles but it's still kind of a timeline from left to right. It turns out that we're pretty bad at communicating our visions when we make LARPs. And, and when we make ambitious games, we always have, like we, when any kind of experience design, you have the potential, like you have the opportunity of deciding everything. You can change everything in the experience from what is expected. But there is a cognitive load, the workload for you is enormous and the cognitive load for the players is also enormous. So typically you, you try to like give them some things that they know and some things that they know, don't know. But we're not really great at, at sort of communicating uh, which parts are which. Um, but here, still, in the last, I would say, five years, maybe, maybe not, not much more than that, certainly not more than age, eight, we become kind of better at designing what's around the runtime. So like this next circle is like pretty much like the process of playing the LARP. This is now a norm, I think, in the sort of Nordic community. We put a lot of work into like, what is the optimal way of communicating what this LARP is and teaching the players how to play it? Is it handouts? Is it, what's the website? What's this? Is the design document? And so on. How are the relationships of the characters established and practiced and, and put in place. Workshop design has become a discipline in Nordic design that is just as important for the design of your LARP as the design of the runtime. And of course, we, you know, logistics, if you suck at logistics, you're still screwed because that's the, that's the base of the Maslow pyramid, right? And after the runtime, we have also become a lot better at thinking uh, at how do we structure the rolling, how do we structure debrief, where, what is the frame for this reflection period that we think that, that where, the, where the players construct the story and the meaning of their experience. And in EduLARP, actually, I think that was a big influencer here. When, when people started to be serious about EduLARP, they said, oh, so a good thing to know about EduLARP is like that you have this simulation or you have the LARP and that's where the experience is, but the learning happens after. The learning happens in the, in the reflection period and this is like a documented fact. And then, you know, I heard that and I'm like, oh, I wonder if that's true for all LARP. And it's like, yes. <laughs> In fact, that is probably true for all art. And we, we start to talk about, we have this concept of the week of stories, like when, when, do you, when is the time to tell stories and when is the time to give critical feedback? These are some terminologies that we're starting to, starting to use. And we've gotten better at, at designing meta stuff that happens during the runtime. There are more tools for how you can interact between the player level and the, and the, and the character level. And, and, and also creature comfort stuff, like again, the bottom of the Maslow pyramid here is at the bottom, so like off for game room. You say, okay, maybe it doesn't break the aesthetics of my play too much to just give some, the players some cookies. Like they're very hungry, they're marching in Siberia, but they can, or whatever, but they can also go to this place and I'm just gonna give them some cookies so that I get them biologically functioning enough so I can put them back into the play. Oh, that's good design. Okay, 
So basically, we, decided, we expanded the concept of LARP design a few years ago from just the runtime to runtime plus all of this. We call it the paralarp. In a book, I would show you a book if I had a book. In a book, the paratext, the text of the book is like, for instance, the novel in the novel. But the paratext is everything that's like on the cover and the printing information and the stuff that's on the, on the back, printed on the back of the book, all of that is the paratext. And uh, I don't know if it makes any sense, but I said this like somewhere in a lecture seven years ago and it's stuck. So now we call this the paralarp. <laughs> all of the text is part of the LARP that teaches you how to engage with it and helps you organize the information that's in the actual LARP and, and, and becomes your interface to it. That's the paralarp. Okay, and this needs to be designed also. Problem solved? Is the problem solved? Are all LARPs good? <laughs> no. Do all LARPers have good experience at all LARPs? No. Damn it. Weirdly, there are still players who aren't happy. Damn it. And there are still LARPs that don't work, even when the design like, seems that it should work. And when we started looking closer at this, we realized that there are a lot of things that could still go wrong. So some of the things that can still go wrong, even if you've done all of this stuff right, is stuff like this. The wrong players show up. And I don't, by that I don't mean like the players signed up to some completely different LARP. At conventions it happens and they're like, yes, vampire! And you're like, what? No, this is my cancer LARP. Um, because they got the wrong room number or something. That can also happen, but that's very rare. That's, <laughs> but it's more like, wait, I came to play like an adventure and this is a brooding Finnish cupboard LARP. Like how the hell, like how can I even do this? I was told at dinner during a really random and uh, exciting Knutpunkt dinner conversation today that in the Nuremberg LARP community in Germany, maybe all over in Germany, I don't know, they have formalized some language. So that when you look in the LARP calendar for like what kinds of, of LARP you're signing up for, it can say uh, ambience or plot. And if you go to an ambient LARP, which is about like the atmosphere, and you expect to have a main plot that you can play, it's your own fault, because like, it's clearly stated in the calendar that there will be no main plot here. But on the, if, on the other hand, it's cultural knowledge. If you go to a, main, to a plot heavy LARP, there will still be some ambience, and you can choose to play that. It's a valid way of playing it, is to only play it for the atmosphere. So I can't use that information, because I don't have the cultural knowledge to read those codes, but the local players can use this formalized information to make choices about which LARPs to sign up to. But very often, I think, when we have real shit storms, like somebody really flakes at you at the LARP, they're at the wrong LARP. And by the way, it's not their fault. It's your fault. Sorry. I'm sorry. It's your responsibility that they showed up to the wrong LARP. That's where we have dropped the ball when that happens. But that's the thing that could happen. Another thing that could happen is that a player becomes the victim of sexual harassment. That's your thing. That can happen. That's the thing that can make LARPs go really damn wrong for for participants, or for, and for, not just for them, but for a bunch of, of participants who are effect, affected by this. A uh, completely different kind of thing that can happen is that a, a new player comes, joins your campaign or comes to your LARP and they don't know people and they don't get play. If, if it's a plot-heavy LARP, it may be that they are not able, their character is not able to ho hook onto the plot and therefore has no meaningful agency in the story. If it's an, an, like a, a, you know, a Nordic Angst LARP, it might be that finished, all the cupboards are full with people who already know each other from before, and like, I want to cry with that guy because I trust them. Like, stranger, I don't want to cry with the stranger in the cupboard. Um, could be a social dynamic thing like that. Some people are now looking at, is this an actual example? No, that's like a jokey example. Um, but an, an actual example could be that, that, that people gravitate towards, with heavier content, people would gravitate towards players that they maybe already trust. <laughs> And then some people can get sort of shut out of interesting scenes for that reason when they're new. They're not becoming integrated in the action in a natural way. That's a, a very normal failure mode for a very well-designed LARP. And I think that there's very little that you can do here to actually fix it. If you're very aware of it, you can use your relationship design and your work to, to build the relationships in a way that supports player integration into the story, a character integration into the story, and you can build the workshops in a way that cre rapidly creates a sense of trust um, between, among the players. And I think Bjarke will talk a little bit tomorrow about just some physical hacks that you can use uh, for that, for instance. But basically, we have identified in the last few years that there are all kinds of problems that still can't be, like even with this ex expanded idea of LARP design, they still can't be um, resolved. And a lot of that has to do with expectation management, but also a lot of it has to do with memories and, and legacy. But I mean, of course, it's also like, if, is sexual harassment your fault? 
or if someone doesn't dare to play or if someone doesn't succeed in, in playing, is that your fault? <laughs> well, maybe not, but it is your responsibility. And even if you don't think it's your responsibility, it's still your problem. You see this? Like, so it doesn't really, ultimately it doesn't matter. Is it your fault that this thing happened that made the player un unhappy? Well, maybe it's not your fault. Who knows? But it is your problem because that player, for that player, this LARP is not working. And for the, for the players around them, therefore, it's probably not working. So you have a choice here, which is that you can either shrug and go like, well, it's too bad. That's just the, these kinds of things. Some, some players will not be happy. And that is valid. And you may not have resources to do anything more than that in your organizing crew. Or you can design your way out of this problem and go, OK, like there are choices that I can make to prevent these situations. Or I can have processes in place for when it happens. So clearly, as we're starting to see here, we're going to need another circle. Um, and now, <laughs> <coughs> so now, um, Yes. OK. Runtime is affected and controlled by everything that happens before the LARP. And now I should also say that now I, it got too complicated. So now I completely dropped Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So that's no longer like a, a, an axis here at all. OK. The runtime is affected and controlled by everything that happens before the LARP, like handouts and workshops and so on. And the um, effect of your LARP, the impact of your LARP on the players and on the community, and the legacy of your LARP uh, as a as a thing that exists in the world, that is affected by, uh, by, the, stuff, by the work itself and by, by the stuff you do before, but also very much by the, the stuff that you do after the runtime. But unexpectedly, or totally expectedly, the overall experience is shaped by the culture of the players who play your thing and the wider culture in general. And as I said, this is uh, tricky because <laughs> Uh, because the, the, um, the culture is never just one thing. OK, so player selection is here. That's a whole process. And that, that, that's a two-way process, or like a multi-way process. You announce your LARP, and then people are interested in your LARP, and then you are interested in some players, and then you hope for those two to, to match in some way. So there are, some, there are some completely new and much more interesting, I think, design questions now, because I'm pretty comfortable with the stuff in the middle of the circle. So for me right now, this is exciting. How is it decided which LARPs are in interesting and cool? What kinds of currencies? Is it how beautiful the web page is? Is it how strong the, the, the concept is? Is it how expensive the castle looks? Is it who are the organizers? Is it, you know, there are many different kinds of currencies that affect this. Are there many LARPs to choose from? Or are there few LARPs to choose from for the players? This will affect the value of your LARP in the marketplace, so to speak, very much. Can the players that you want to play your LARP, can they afford to play your LARP? How does your status play in? And very importantly, how does hype attach itself to your LARP? So there are two completely unrelated paths, or, or very loosely related path, kinds of communication that exist before your LARP. One is the communication that you put out there, and the other is, if you remember in the eye, is the, the blue line players are talking about your LARP. Uh, that can get completely out of hand because people can be making up all kinds of stories. Like there can be misunderstandings or ideas or like they can have fantasies about what they would want your LARP to be and they're going to tell people that that's the case in some forum somewhere. And you don't have time to be everywhere on the internet to, to do this, to, to, to figure this out. But one thing that is a very risky strategy that a lot of LARPs do is that they generate hype on purpose. And by hype, I mean sort of excitement and big promises. Like you have some flashy pictures and you have some very strong concepts, but you have very little information of what the, the game will actually be. What kinds of activities will people be doing? What kind of play is available to the players? And it's possible to fall in love with the LARP, which is completely the wrong kind of LARP for me as a player, because I am judging it based on, on the general excitement in the community and some very loose concepts, aka hype rather than the actual design itself. And this is a problem because here, the interests of you as the person who needs to sell the tickets to the LARP, who is the designer in the first part, like you, the producer of the LARP, let's say, who needs to sell the ticket. Your interests are to sell the ticket. You, the designer of the LARP, the person who is charge of the people having a good experience in the runtime, that person's goal is that the right players show up. 
So you are operating on two completely goals that are completely in opposition to each other. The first, you, the producer hat me, I want as a producer that everybody wants to play my game. I as a designer want the right people to play my game. But reaching the right people is a lot harder than reaching everybody and hoping for the best. And also, if I'm not getting paid as a LARP designer, as indeed, even when we make LARPs for money, in practice we're basically not getting paid, um, then I am operating on, on, on some other economies. Like I, my economy, what I'm getting paid in is credibility in the community. So I want people to be excited about my LARPs because that makes me feel like I'm making the cool LARPs. And that is valuable to me. Unfortunately, that is not valuable to the outcome of my actual LARP, you see. So these are some, I don't have a lot of answers here. These are more like questions, but I think that, that these aren't very hard. Just like with all of this other like nuanced community stuff that has to do with like experience design and the social spaces and the physical spaces in which we interact. Communication also happens in social spaces and physical spaces. And, and I think that we are, if we are aware of these things, we can think, of, think them through and make design choices and not traditional cho choices in all of the stages of our, of our communication and design of our LARP and work for all players, then designing your marketing and your communication is probably just as important actually as designing your workshop. Because it doesn't help if you have the perfect workshop if the wrong players have signed up for your LARP. And similarly, like how can we affect, like if there's a sexual harassment problem in our community, as there is you know, in, in the world, so therefore also again in our community, if we don't design against it, then we have it because it exists in the world and that's just how this stuff works. What can we do as designers? How do we take care of each other? How do we interact with people we don't know? And these are social dynamics that can be made visible through the simple act of like focusing your gaze on what is the social dynamic in these rooms. But these rooms is not just one magic circle. There's so many magic circles. It's like I, the players who show up to my LARP, how do they interact together before the LARP starts? Is everybody included? Do they all trust each other? By the time the LARP, the runtime starts, do all of the players feel that they can trust the other players? By the time the LARP ends, do they still feel that? When the after party happens. And here there are other things that we can think about. What is our, our, our um, culture of partying? And how do we negotiate intimacy in social spaces? It's at your LARP. It's in the communication around your LARP. It's in your LARP club or society or association, if you have one of those. It's at your conventions. It's at this convention. And when you travel to a new environment, you look at what people are doing and you pick up the social cues, you think. And if, there aren't, if nobody has specifically told you about how we're doing things here, and if people aren't following the, the culture of how we're doing those things here, then you're just going to do whatever is offered to you. And that puts some players who are new to communities at risk from sexual predators, if there are sexual predators in the community. So there are two completely different things that need to happen. Is one, we need to get rid of the predators. That would, should be obvious. But also that we should have a culture where we like, keep an eye out and take care of each other. And the new players don't get isolated in the corner with a middle-aged man giving them liquor, because that's probably not great. By the way, also not get, I mean, even if the person giving them liquor in a corner is a middle-aged woman, also not great. In fact, if the only way to integrate with your LARP community is through the ingestion of alcohol, you might have a little cultural problem there. By you, I mean all of us. So suddenly there are all other kinds of, of things that are happening here that are all part of the experience of the LARP, the wider experience of the LARP, that affect how does it feel to play your LARP. When I have played the LARP, like, who am I afterwards? How have I changed? What, part of, what kind of communities am I part of after? So I have some words like media, yeah, sure, social scripts. It's like how do we behave in different situations in the different cultures that we're part of. Um, helping out. Do we have a community of a culture of helping out? Who helps out where, how? That's a really good way, by the way, to if you want to decide, like if you want your player base to trust each other, build the what happens before the LARP so that they that they need to to solve some practical problem together, like make them raise a tent together or some shit like that. Like of course you could do it more efficiently on your own. That's not the point. If they solve a problem together, they're gonna like each other so much better. It's very simple, like social hacking. What are the communities and how do they interlock? And it's good to think about that you're always creating a community. Like if you're, when you, the, as the selection process, what's happening in the player selection is that all the potential players transform gradually into the community of players. And 
it's possible that that community coalesces on the internet before you actually get them in your control, before they enter your Facebook groups and before they enter your workshop room and so on. So you might want to be there before, like when that selection process is happening and when that group is developing their group culture, that's when you need to be in there establishing some norms about how the community of this LARP will be and how it will be selected. Standards of care and performing friendship. LARP is very interesting. When we do LARPs afterwards, we end up with these very sort of high trust relationships to people that we don't know very well at all. What are the rituals of friendship? How do we, how do we in the communities that we're part of, of that specific LARP and the wider LARP community, what are the actions through which we show friendship to each other? So at Knutpunkt, there's a very high hugging norm, and I've had a cold, cold, this whole thing, and I've been going, this is my 20th year, so I have 150 Facebook friends who have attended this event. That's 150 people that I should hug, and I've had to say, no, I'm, I'm sorry, I can't hug you. 150 times, or thereabouts, in this few, way, few, and I've been breaking a social code every time. Hugging is comfortable for some people, it's not comfortable for everybody, but it would be nice if there were some additional friendship action rituals that I can use in the off-game space to ritually show that I like you people very much. And these are things that we can also design and establish. After we played LARPs together, a culture of the people who played that LARP or the people who played that run of the LARP also emerges. Nostalgia about a LARP is a very uh, central way, apparently, of how we process LARP experiences after the fact, sometimes many years afterwards. But especially in the sort of, let's say, the few months after an event, if it's been successful and intense, a lot of people want to meet together and do things. And the players will do this anyway. So you can, you can think about how do you design this. So there are LARP designers who make choices which are very much about making them seem cool or like creating a cult around the LARP. That is something you can choose to do. And you should know that then you're, you've created a, a persona around, or a cult around, your, around you as a designer, and you have created a cult around the game you made, or one or the other. I'm not saying, like, it's maybe not the most ethical choice. It's probably not bad. Like, if that rocks, you know, if you think that's cool, that's cool. But I think it might be, like, maybe in conflict with some of our co-creation goals, or, like, whatever, but be aware that that is something that can happen. And if you don't want that to happen, then you want to make some other choices about how do we talk about this LARP afterwards. And that's something that you have to establish or your players will do it for you. In jokes and lingo, there's nothing more annoying than people who have played a LARP that you haven't played. I like, I've played College of Wizardry twice, but I don't understand half of what the College of Wizardry people are saying now, because like, there are so many in-jokes that I can't even like, follow. And I noticed that that makes me want to play the LARP again. <laughs> and that's very powerful, because I'm part of that community as well. Like, that is one of my many LARP communities, people who have played College of Wizardry and enjoyed it. Um, but and again, like, but that's, is that intentional? Um, is that a marketing strategy? Is that excluding some people? is that inviting people, all of those things affect how everybody who plays College of Wizard in the future will feel about it and what expectations they will have. And they will have an expectations when they leave the LARP that they will be part of a community that means something. And if not everybody gets that, then they might be super disappointed because it's been implicitly promised, not by the organizers at all, but by the super fans of that LARP series. So again, so many things are affecting uh, the experience. But I think if we are aware that the wider community is also something that is an object of design, because I know this goes back to everything we said at the very beginning, that every time, like all the cultures that we have are shaped through human choices, either iteratively or like very actively. And within a culture, there are all of these little bubbles, and in the bubbles we do, different, we do things differently, and that's great because those bubbles, like the magic circles inside each specific culture, are also, especially if they have a ritual character, they, they are also a space where we can change. We can change the meanings of things, we can change the meanings of situations, we can change the social roles of the people who are in, interacting with each other inside those bubbles, and that means that we can change the culture that they are part of through how those interactions are structured. So if we're just thinking about like what is LARP design, it looks probably sometime like this. In the middle is your thing, which might be your LARP, and of course that breaks down into a lot of like different circles 
where there might be inside the fiction, there might be specific rituals and events and practices and all of that. And then around the runtime, there's your, there's your workshops and there's your communication, all of that stuff is there. And then around that is your participants' experience as they move through your LARP. And that is, to a great part, something that you can affect through design, but not all of it. Because of all of those functions, such as other people's opinions and rumors and hype and so on. And the, the emergent culture of the specific participants in your specific thing. And around their experience is our culture. And by our culture, again, that's a bunch of nested circles. Basically, you know, if you're organizing for your local LARP group in France, it might be the, the culture of your local LARP group in France. And around that is another circle that says, the, the culture of your city in France, or the people of your socioeconomic background in France, in that part of France, for instance, and so on. But the nice thing is that this is still a timeline. And every time we create something like this that is transformative, and every time people go through something that is transformative, like LARPs are, and like all of, all of this stuff is, like life is, they change. So the practices and the norms and the behaviors and the roles change through the actions that we make. So when you make this, make aware design decisions about your LARP. What is the culture of this LARP going to be? And even if it just comes from the place like, I want this LARP to work. I'm going to make this horror LARP. And to, for this horror LARP to be scary enough, I just want these people to trust each other enough so that they can be really scary together and still like each other after. So maybe you design some really beautiful community shit around your LARP to enable that play experience. It's not to make the world a better place. It's just to be able to enable that horror story. That's totally valid. But if you do that well, you have created a group of people who were strangers, who used to be strangers, who now suddenly trust each other to a very high degree. And that's actually a pretty powerful thing. So every time we make something, we also change all of the layers of culture. It, the information goes in, but it also trickles out. And if the stuff that happens at the middle is very powerful, then the effect on the humans that were there is quite powerful. Sometimes it can be annoying to other people, like when they have a lot of in-jokes, but sometimes it can be super powerful to other people. Like, hey, the worldview of these people just changed, or the, the things that they think are normal just change. Suddenly we have some people who feel like, you know, suddenly we have a bunch of American acquaintances who are like, or friends who are like, going to Poland is a thing that you can do as an American student. Like it's, somebody told me at this convention, Oh, you know, in America, people say that travel is so expensive, but that's like a myth to keep us down, because when you look at it, and yes, it's expensive, but it's not as all as expensive as people say. Okay, how many people's worldview were just opened by this random wizard college? Like, that's a very surprising effect, and I'm pretty sure that nobody said that Americans would be getting passports. For the, like, that nobody went in and said, my design goal <laughs> is to make more people travel to Central Europe from everywhere in, like, that is not, but that's the thing that happened in the world. That's a completely weird side effect of something beautiful being created in the middle. So, um, designing experiences is designing what kinds of worlds we live in. Yeah. And I think that, I mean, and this is actually true, but it sounds like I'm making this shit up. <laughs> Even though I have completely walked you through this argument and you all have the lived experience to know that I am right. But if we break it up a little bit, it's something like this. Designing experiences is designing behaviors. And designing behaviors is designing cultures. You can actually say that designing experience is designing actions. And designing actions is designing behaviors. And designing behaviors is designing cultures. And designing cultures is designing what kinds of worlds we're living. Because you make the design choices based on your values and goals for your thing. And if we have, if we're going to live in this world, it means we're going to try, we're going to have to try to design a better world and more sustainable, resilient cultures that suck less. Because like at this point, we're going to be either part of the problem of the world or we're going to be part of the solution of the world. And we have a moral obligation to try and leave this mess a little bit better than we found it or a lot better than we found it. OK, this is my last slide. Uh, I have two tips for you. And then we actually have some little, little time for discussion and or questions. I would say that tomorrow at 1.15, Son, Son, where are you there, is hosting uh, something called the Designers Hour, where LARP designers will talk about their solutions for like in, like, in this LARP, I ha we had this challenge, and we solved it in this one really specific way. And that would be a very zoomed in <laughs> look at like what's happening inside or around that, the, the, the central circle at the, at the, uh, in the middle. And also in this room, 
at 6.15 in the evening, Bjarke will talk uh, specifically about like, the LARP design tools of, from, like, based on all of this theory, he's gonna go more into like, some stuff that you can do to actually change the behaviors of your, your participants in ways that you would uh, like them to. And that is all I had to say. Thank you. It is possible to, it is possible to decide many of these uh, things from, but is it our um, responsibility? Is it our responsibility? Yep. Some, some people say yep. Um, well, so there are different, I think it depends a little bit on who your audience is. And it's, there are two completely different ways, at least two completely different ways to think about target audience in LARP. Uh, one is about like who, like your target audience could be like children or ex experienced LARPers or something like that. And then you categorize them based on like their existing skill set and or like the kinds of entertainment that and or art that they enjoy or something like that. Um, but the other way of thinking of it is like how close are they to your expectations? So if you make a LARP for your closest friends, a lot of that stuff is never even going to come up. Like you're never going to need to think about any of that stuff because maybe you don't even tell anybody on the internet that you've made this LARP until after it happened. Like that is, that is one way of doing it. Um, if you're making a LARP as a sort of voluntary project like most of us are, are doing and it's a non-profit thing and everybody's doing it out of passion, you know, and you have some selectivity of some kind around the players, I, I, again, like I, a lot of that stuff's not going to be necessary um, you're going to want to do some of it because you have a personal relationship to all of these people. But if you, if you open a LARP up as a kind of product, like whether or not you are in fact a company, but if, you're kind of, if it's open to everybody and you say, this is something we're offering to the world, anybody, if you pay the money, you are welcome to do this thing, then, you know, then the people who, are, who, are, um, who you are opening it to is such a large group that there's suddenly like, um, certainly if you're a company, and certainly if you're a company in a litigious culture like the United States, that's why, why, why Ben is yelling yes in the, in the back. You know, you're kind of forced to care about this stuff because it is a lot of the problems that can go wrong are, are legally your responsibility. But it's also a kind of moral responsibility, I think. Like if I tell people, and especially if they're my friends, if I tell people this is gonna be an awesome LARP and then I don't do the work, that is a betrayal of our trust. And it's going to hurt my cred, but it's also going to hurt the community in the sense of, of like the, the community of trust of people who create things together because everybody puts so much into it. So you have to deliver on your, on your promises. And often the only way to deliver on your promises is to do all of this other goddamn work like months before. Yes. I mean, uh, thank you, Akil, but you can, I will, you can comment on this as well. Like the, on your question, it's, you don't have to design for everything. Uh, but it's really good to consider most of the things, mm -hmm. if not all, uh, because like then you you probably should do an active choice of like should we design for hype or should we care about hype? Mm -hmm. Should we care about how this could uh, like in your little organizing group? Should we talk about how we should handle thing on Facebook if this happens? Mm -hmm. No, let's not talk about that. Okay, and then you can make an active choice about like what stuff you care about or not. Then if you're then then like yeah, let's go through all of the things Jok reminded us. Yeah, but also like if you're Ben and you're running a LARP for hundreds of players that's going to run again and again and again and again and it's open for everybody and you have a, a, a player base that were, which includes a lot of differently abled players for instance, then it makes a lot of sense to say okay, we're just going to from the very beginning we're going to design this whole game so that ability, like physical ability for instance is not going to be like a factor. You can play this in a wheelchair lying down like you can, this LARP will be playable to you, the spaces will be accessible to you and so on. If you're organizing a LARP for like 15 friends, you're going to know if one of them has needs that are somehow different from the other players, and then you can just have a negotiation or make an adaptation in a way like after the fact for that person. So it's also like at what point does it make sense to invest all of your resources? What is important to you? So it is about your practical design goals, of course, but it is also very much about your values. If you're in this for the goal of making an inclusive society, then probably you should try and make inclusive games from the beginning. It makes sense that that would be a priority. If you're in this to make awesome LARPs, and you also want them to be ex inclusive, then you know, then the inclusivity stuff can can um, take a little, so a much lower uh, percentage of your mind share or like of your or of your attention and your resources. However, the early, if you want to achieve something like any kind of, if you want to make anything better in design, the earlier 
it's included in the process, the cheaper and easier it'll be always. So again, like thinking through the whole timeline, which is a drag, before you start writing your characters or whatever is the traditional way of approaching design in your community, <laughs> it's going to save you so much effort and it's going to make some of this stuff, solving this stuff is going to be so damn easy if you think about it in advance, very difficult to solve once the shitstorm has already happened in some way or when the players are on site screaming at you. Uh, yeah, and it's also like if you, if you look at your project as a project, you usually have like a goal. Mm -hmm. we, I want to make a lark in a castle. What is the vision? That people have a magical experience. Those things still apply if you design all this out stuff. Very, yes. Very importantly, not everybody actually does that. Sometimes people are like, I have a really cool concept or I have a really cool location and that's where you start. Uh, and I, I would say that the majority of the LARP projects that I've ever been involved with have been like that. But it's useful, I have unfortunately learned through experience, that it would be very useful if we had at that point relatively early step, to, taken a step back and been awesome and also what are our goals? Because <laughs> again, you cannot do good design if you don't know what you're like working towards. You can change that, that's what iterative design means. You test things and then you change it. Sometimes the goal was wrong and sometimes the method was wrong. So you can change it during the thing. Anas? Yeah, it fits into this. I think I think it's fantastic talk. Thank you very much. I love the, the I. Uh, uh, I love you to me. So we can refer to it. Uh, one of the things that I most fear is oversteering. When we are trying to solve problems, I'm completely agreeing with a lot of the things that we should do. But when we are trying to design it too much, that we destroy what we want to achieve. Mm -mm. And that I think is, I, 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 it's not saying that we should not try to, to design it, it's just to know that a lot of projects that I've been doing, when we've tried to design it, it failed. If we are do, uh, working with professional intuition, then it, it's a, a know that we cannot plan for everything, mm. then it can succeed. Yeah, I think that there's a, there's a thing where you can't, like, because there are all, the work is never going to run out. So, so if you spend all, you can spend all of the resources of your organizations before you even announce the LARP. That happens super often, actually. You get a group together, you have a strong idea, you start working on the idea, and there is never an announcement because you have used all the resources before you even got to that point. I don't like LARPs that announce a web page before they have anything else. But the fact is that that's a way to motivate you to get the thing done. <laughs> like, that is a kind of commitment. I don't think it's, like, it's, not, a like, it's not a good valid tool for me, but like, I, I see how that is a thing, that that is a choice that you can totally make. Um, I was going to say that it's interesting that, that the exact historic moment when we started to figure this out is also the moment when black box LARPs uh, became an, an expansively like, big thing. And there are many reasons for that. One is the LARP Writer Summer School, because of a lot of, of resource reasons, has been teaching black box design um, as the norm, in a way. So we have, I don't know, like 500 students or something come through there uh, who, who think that this is the, like, the standard way of LARPing, is to go into a black box and, and, and like, touch each other and cry. No, I'm joking. Um, but, but so that's one thing. But another thing is that, that this idea that everything is a designable surface, like we can change how language works, we can LARP without language, we can, like there's, no, there's literally nothing that we cannot change, is really overwhelming. And a nice way of approaching that is to go into an empty room and say, okay, we have darkness, and then we have at least one player. What do we do now? Okay, let's add a lamp. And uh, okay, what are we doing? Let's have a vision or an, an action or a movement and you start, you, you start it from the, like you start with the empty plate and then you do everything else. And that's, in, if, you, if we're thinking that the opposite of doing like, you, so you can design in a tradition, which is you have an idea of what LARPs usually are and then you tweak that. Or you can design like bespoke systems where you start with, with like an empty tabula rasa and then you, or an empty room or an empty plate or just like one idea and then you work from outwards from that. Both of those are completely valid ways of doing it, but if you are doing one or the other, I would recommend to you to try the other method, because it might teach you some tools that will focus your design quite a lot. Monica? I think you all touched a bit upon it um, on this one with the, the early example of uh, the kids dancing in a room which most people would be dancing. Yeah. Now you're talking again about testing, and I think that would be the perfect thing compared to also something you've talked about with the virtual reality, that that's really testable. If yeah. you have an interaction, you could put somebody in that room and go, are you really comfortable dancing? 
Yeah. Uh, okay, then we have to fix that part of our LARP. I don't like to go to the first run of a big LARP because I know that they're going to, like, I, because we run big LARPs at my company as well, I know the second run will be better. Will be. So now I think it's a good norm to say the first run maybe should be a little bit cheaper. We can't always do it. My company will not always do it. I'm sorry, because it's not always practical. But maybe, maybe it could be a good thing to do. Uh, yeah, no, a big LARPs can be tested. There's been a myth in this community for the longest time that you have to do like a three-year project where everything is, has never been tried before. And if it fails, well, that's the kind of thing that you don't know until you run the LARP. Yes, you can know it. You can take down every little element and try it. And then you can reduce the number of surprises with like 75%. Boo. Uh, you talk a lot about meeting expectations with by, by, as a marketing group. It's insanely crucial for everything. Actually. Have you ever worked with exceeding expectations? Normally, if you in quality production, they have like, if you go to a very fancy hotel, they normally exceed your expectations. They do the, the sort of design show. Yeah, going the extra mile. Yeah. Can I answer this one? Yes, Ben. Um, Experience designs are hard to transact on. So services, you can exceed expectations because people have a level of precision about what they expect, what they get. And experiences, because they are so variable, it's actually hard to know what exceeding expectations even is. And when you examine that, you learn it's actually very hard to know what meeting expectations is. You consider that everyone can have a very, very different experience in the same life. Yes, uh, but also, you know, but uh, yes, but the answer is also, oh yeah, there's a lot of knowledge. So like one well-known, well-established fact, and Bjarke is going to go into more of this tomorrow, but and I don't think he has this example, so I'm just going to say it. So about 80% of the experience of like the person who has an experience, about 80% of that experience is from the last 20% of time. Johanna was talking yesterday about a LARP, about the wow effects, uh, about in a LARP in his design retrospective, and saying that, well, if you have like a really cool location, you are, it's a design choice that you can make is that, is, does the whole LARP take place in that location? Or do you like roll it out at the end so you have a really cool finale? finale? And especially if your LARP is a little weak, maybe save the big bang to, to the end. And you put people into this place that expands the, the world of the LARP and they're like, whoa! And that's going to give you, you know, it's a very manipulative, of course, but, but people want to have a good experience. So it's a decent thing to do, I think, is to manipulate them in ways that really helps them to get the thing that they want. So, so yes, in, in that way, uh, there are things that you can do. Uh, but surprising people is another one. Now it's five past, so I'm going to have to end. Uh, remember to go to the sequel of this talk tomorrow at 6.15 in this room. Thank you very much.